a one of my favorite books of all time is The Fire Next Time by one of my favorite authors of all time. And this is one of my favorite quotes from that book. This is James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time. Life is tragic simply because the earth turns and the sun inexorably rises and sets. And one day for each of us, the sun will go down for the last, last time. Perhaps the whole root of our trouble, the human trouble, is that we will sacrifice all the beauty of our lives, will imprison ourselves in totems, taboos, crosses, blood sacrifices, steeples, mosques, races, armies, flags, nations, in order to deny the fact of death which is the only fact we have. It seems to me that one ought to rejoice in the fact of death, ought to decide indeed to earn one's death by confronting with passion the conundrum of life. It's the very last day of July, and last year at this time, my siblings and I were preparing for my dad, Richard Lewis Sr., to die. He had been losing weight for a year. We thought he had spinal stenosis and that didn't really explain the weight loss, but the weight began to fall off. This six foot one, 180 pound guy, always slim, always strong, was losing muscle mass was losing his ability to stand and cook, which he loved to do, losing his ability to hold the cards and deal them out to play big whist or spades. And then he was diagnosed with ALS. My dad, who had three stripes as an airman in the Air Force, who served in the Korean War, who worked on B-52 bombers, uh, my dad was a strong lion of a person. And he was losing himself. He was losing Richard himself. His laughter stayed, his incredibly smart brain stayed, but he couldn't dance and he loved dancing. He loved dancing. He couldn't stand and cook and he loved standing and cooking outside in the backyard, on the grill, at the stove, doing the morning breakfast routine. If you come home from college or from from life to visit dad is making you breakfast. He loved working in his garden and he was losing himself. And finally, on August 15th, we lost him. I can feel in my body how the loss of him is coming to the front of my consciousness. And I'm sure that you who have lost uncles or aunts or moms or dads or friends know what that feels like. It's back here, and it just works its way up here. And I don't think it ever goes away fully, but certainly this year, it feels very fresh for Dad not to be here with us. I read this text uh, from James Baldwin, and I think of the phrase, earn your death, earn your death by the way you live your life with passion. Wow, earn your death. Don't hide the fact, don't masquerade the fact, don't deny the fact that we're gonna die with the proppings up that we might do. He's clearly bald when talking about religion when he says steeples or mosques or blood sacrifices or crosses, that religion can prop us up around the idea of death can make us feel that we can deny it, that we can maybe miss it all together, just skip right over death into an afterlife because we have lived a good life or, or, or an afterlife where we haven't lived a good life, but just sort of manage our feeling of anxiety and um, impermanence by having religion or, or wars or you know strife or 
battles, the ways we manage the feeling of impermanence, following the saying, are impermanent. And what if we lived our life in such a way that we earn our death? I, I think my dad did that. I think dad lived his life. I mean, he was a smart little boy who grew up in Meridian, Mississippi, in poverty, in the Depression, in Jim Crow, the only boy uh, to a mother and a father who broke up, but he and his sister ended up with a stepdad, and there were two more sisters. He's the only boy in this family. It's a brilliant boy, a grade skipping boy. Teach, teach the adults uh, about God in Sunday school kind of boy. Precocious boy, skinny, long legged boy, who grew to be a tall, lean, good looking man who went into the Air Force and escaped the South. Met my mom in Omaha, Nebraska at the Offord Air Force Base where she came to live with her brother, Gus. Dad and Gus were friends, mom and dad would dance together at the officer's club. They fell in love, they found their thrill on Blueberry Hill, we heard. They got together, they got married. My cousin and I, Uncle Gus's daughter, Kathy and I were born six days apart. Uh, these two couples were friends and they had a big old party nine months before we were born. Mommy and Daddy had the house on the Air Force Base where the people would come to party, to listen to music. Sam Cooke and James Brown and Ella Fitzgerald dance to the hi-fi. Peanuts on the table. I remember the peanuts on the table. The pillow mints and the peanuts on the table and the fried chicken and the potato salad afterwards, the laughter, the laughter, the sounds of their laughter as I'm falling asleep. I remember the happy, playful, jazz-loving, blues-loving, card-playing, church-going, singing in the choir, being on the usher board of my mom and dad's life, full life. They ended up with five and a half of us, six kids, and they, like, played with us and drove us everywhere and taught us how to do all the things, piano lessons, trumpet lessons, guitar lessons, ballet lessons, shooting hoops in the backyard, playing badminton, fun. <laughs> the normal amount of family crazy, but fun, fun, joyful life, hardworking life, living life in a way to earn one's death. I mean, how do you live your life to earn your death? Filling up your life with the things of life. The anxiety, the inevitability of, of death can make us feel anxious, can make us feel afraid, can make us feel cautious, can make us um, devoid of joy, withdrawn from love, avoiding of risk. And just today at this welcome table, just this conversation with you, I'm wanting to say there's enough reason to feel anxious about the world and all of the death around us. But what if we took Jim Baldwin at his at his word, at his encouragement, and, and decide to fill up our life, the cup that is our life, the vessel that is our life, with life. What makes you laugh? Do it. What gives you satisfaction? Do it. What? Where's your curiosity? Try it. Well, What's the taste that you need in your mouth before you go to sleep at night? Sip it. Where's your quiet space? Go there. Make an altar there. Make a journey to it. Where's your, where's your playful space? Who are your people? 
How do you build rituals and time into living your life so that you earn your death? And maybe Jesus would say it this way, that he came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. Not living your life to protect yourself from death, not living your life to make sure that after life you parachute into a safe place, a heavenly place, but really living your life as though this is the heaven on earth space. Now what do you do? Now what do you do to, to fill your life up with goodness and generosity and kindness and the kinds of sacrifices that make sense to sacrifice so somebody else can have life also? How do you earn your death by living your life? I'm so tired today because I'm cramming in some stuff so I can go on vacation. And when I get on vacation, I'm going to sit in the grassy yard and fan off mosquitoes and listen to bird song. I'm going to pay attention to the things that are in the pond and see what kind of life is happening there. I'm going to read all those books that are on my nightstand and chill out and read them. I'm going to close my eyes and fall asleep in the sun and get chocolatey, chocolatey brown because I love the sun and I'll be chocolatey, chocolatey brown like in the first half hour. I'm going to talk to John and I'm going to listen to John who listens to me all the time and see what he's dreaming about, thinking about. I'm going to watch movies like The Movie Addict I Am, one after the other, just pop some popcorn and watch another one. I'm going to stick my foot in the pond. I'm going to put my body in the hot tub. I'm going to go for a walk in the park. I'm going to get in the car and drive down to the river and look at the water flowing down over the rocks. I'm going to chill out and dream of what Middle Church will do in the fall. I'm going to call my friends that I haven't talked to in a long time and just catch up. I'm going to be in a space with my siblings where we can acknowledge how sad we are about our dad dying, about our mom dying, about what it means to be children who have no parents. I'm going to cry about the world. I'm going to cry about the world and pray for the world. And I'm going to laugh at the silly things that come in my feed, I'm going to fill up my life with life. Because tomorrow's not promised to any of us. And I'm just going to live some with intention. How about you? What do you want to live like? What do you want to do that gives you joy or causes you to think new thoughts? How will you pursue that about which you're curious? How will you reward yourself for just being human on the planet? Is there a time, a day where you can just do nothing and just be yourself? This is my prayer for you, for me abundant life, life lived as though today is the last day where this is the most important moment. Live life in such a way that we earn our death, which is gonna come. So we might as well live. Thank you, Dad, for showing us how to live all the way, all the way to the end. Thank you, Mama, for teaching us to fill our life with joy and purpose. Thank you.
Thank you.